So then the next question is, what are you guys individually doing individually, forget the company, to be the best you can be at what you're doing and growing? Because as leaders, and you know, Chris, you're the leader of the organization. John, you know, you're a leader in your department. You're leading yourself. You're leading whoever it is you're dealing with when you're analyzing assets, the brokers, you know, the people out in the field. You are leading them. So as a leader, both of you in your areas, you got to be developing yourselves. That is your fiduciary responsibility to everybody in your life. This is the Real Estate Investing Experience. We get it. Real estate can be rough sometimes. And that's why we bring in the experts to talk about the experiences you won't hear anywhere else. With your hosts, John Cohen and Chris Grinzik. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Experience. I'm your host, Chris Grenzig. With me, as always, is John Cohen. Sim, uh, we got a good guest in today. I've uh, been doing it a while. Um, similar space, but more in some of the development space as well. So it'll be interesting to hear his journey, his insight, his experiences, his knowledge. Um, so I'm very happy to have him on. So that being said, Greg, thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's great to be here. Good to see you guys. Glad we got all this technology figured out. There we go. Uh, so can you just take a couple minutes to five minutes? Uh, tell us who you are, where you're from, uh, background, experience, and what you do in real estate. Yeah. So, uh, you know, classic adult ADD. So um, I have uh, over the last 20 years, I'm 23 years or so. I started in 1997 as a small remodeling contractor, handyman guy, built that into a $30 million company, started 12 other companies along the way. And uh, so I've done about a quarter billion um, uh, deals, my own real estate deals using my own capital. Um, and then I've done, you know, probably another two, three, 400 million outside of my own personal deals, but went in the Navy right out of high school, didn't go to college, learned it all the hard way from the ground up. Um, I've worked in restaurants and construction, you know, my entire career. So uh, that's why I got into the development business. And that's how I became a developer was through the construction industry. I uh, got all my business training from restaurants before I started my first company in 1997, which, uh, you know, like I said, I scaled that to 30 million, sold it 0405, uh, started another building company in 2007, sold that when everything crashed in 2009. And then I've just been developing and investing ever since. And then I do equity capital. So I'll buy companies, fix them up, sell them or roll up, you know, companies uh, that are complementary or similar and uh, sell that off. So uh, like I said, classic adult ADD, but very focused, very disciplined. Uh, you know, I've got a great approach, but I like to stay busy. I like to do different things. And, uh, you know, kind of the mile wide, mile deep versus the inch wide, mile deep. I've done pretty much every type of, of real estate except a hotel. I haven't built a hotel yet, uh, which I am working on a few of those. So hopefully we'll get some of those out of the ground here in the next few years. But um, yeah, that's me in a nutshell, man. Started out with residential, moved into uh, commercial, done land development deals, subdivision development, mixed use, adaptive reuse, um, ground up, multifamily, uh, storage, mobile home parks, and I've done a little bit of everything. Wow. I don't that, even know. There's a, there's a lot of things to unwrap there. You got your fingers in a lot of different pots. So I think that's phenomenal. Um, I'm curious, how has it been for you to go from you know, one type of thing to another different thing to another different thing. You know, what's it been like? How have you been able to kind of move from, you know, the restaurant to the construction to the development, the development within different assets? Because, you know, we're in multifamily and mobile home parks. And sometimes I'm like, how the fuck do we go to something else if I don't know it? So can you touch a little bit on that process, journey, experience, whatever? Yeah. So, you know, it's not for everybody. So for me, you know, starting out in the res restaurant industry and construction in the restaurant industry, you learn how to become a leader, delegator, motivator, right? You're managing a lot of people, a lot of parts, a lot of pieces. So I started out as, as a manager in a restaurant, and then I had a number of restaurants. So by default, I was taught how to lead, delegate, motivate, how to multitask across a number of units in different regions. Um, and then in the construction side of things, I was geographically limited, right? So if your geography is limited, so my primary corridor was the Outer Banks of North Carolina up into D.C. So that's where all of my contacts were. I'm from Virginia Beach. We lived all over the country being military. My dad was military and I was military. So I've lived in Pensacola, Florida, where I grew up, lived in California. And then my adult years uh, were spent in Virginia and North Carolina. Uh, so I made a lot of contacts up and down that region, working for and with you know very sophisticated developers. So that's how I learned the business guys that are building high rises in DC, Richmond, Norfolk, you know, those areas. Um, and then, you know, like a lot of the property owners from the outer banks are in that New York, New Jersey, 
Pennsylvania region. Uh, so we learning from people, investors, entrepreneurs from those areas coming down and buying beach houses, right? And I was building houses for them, with them, doing renovations for them. So it's really interesting. That's how I kind of learned the different things was by working with different people. And I'm curious, you know, and I like a challenge and I like to do different things and I'm opportunistic. You know, I was asking you guys what you did and you use that word opportunistic. That can mean a lot of things. And it's not just real estate. You know, opportunistic is in the equities markets. It's in business, uh, equity capital, uh, venture capital, and it's also in real estate. So I like a challenge. I like to take advantage of opportunities when they arise. And if somebody brings me a deal, it could be a company. It could be uh, an, an opportunity. It could be a real estate deal. If there's opportunity for upside and potential, you know, to build something or turn something around, I'm in. You know, I'm just, I get excited about it and I do it through other people. So all these different businesses that I've done and these different developments I do, I don't personally do them. I create high level, I'm the intellectual capital at the high level, bringing all the parts and pieces together like a syndicator does, right? You've got appraisers and bankers and lawyers and, you know, uh, the inspectors and the managers and all that and the capital and you bring all that together to create a syndication. I do the same thing with all the different projects. So that's just kind of how it happened. If you've got a small geographic region, you need to be wide in your asset type and class. If you've got a wide geographic region, you're nice and wide, you can be more narrowly focused on your asset type and class. I think that's phenomenal. You broke that down unbelievably well. So thank you for that. Um, can you give me a, a little bit more of a timeline first? How, how old are you now? 52. Okay. Can you break it down a little bit more of like the early years and then, you know, after you've been in the business world for, you know, 10, 15 years, because I know for me and like a lot, so I'm 28 just as a reference and a lot of like my friends and peers, I feel, and I get this way too, are very impatient to be in a position where you're in, where you're, you know, at, you know, in a, basically a, a CEO type of position or, you know, running a business or running multiple things and being a decision maker. Can you talk, give us a little bit more of a reference of a, the time frame Cause it's, it's easy to hear. I did this, 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 and this, and now I'm here. Can you break yeah. that down a little bit more for me? Yep. And it was a long journey and a lot of work. So a lot of young people, you know, your age, they're all wanting to figure this thing out where I mean, I can work 20 hours a week and do all this stuff that you just can't. <laughs> so I work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, literally, you know, sometimes to get where I'm at. So I started, you know, young kid, I was a natural born entrepreneur. So I'd go around the neighborhood knocking on doors, you know, and I'd rake your grass, cut your grass, wash your car, walk your dog, whatever you needed done. And this was, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade. So I'd come up, Hey, I'm Greg, I need to make some money. What do you need done? And uh, so I just had that work ethic. And of course, you know, my dad, military officer, drilled that discipline, that work ethic into me. I did all the chores around the house. So it was just kind of built in. Uh, And then during high school, I always had a job. So I did something, worked in grocery stores. I did telephone sales. One of my jobs was, you know, a telephone solicitor back in the day when you had rotary phones, you know, talk about dialing dialing for dollars. And, uh, you know, just calling people up, trying to raise money for the fraternal order of police, you know, as a teenager. So I got some early training there did door-to-door sales, you know, worked in a bowling alley, um, all kinds of stuff. So then I graduate and, uh, you know, I'm working in restaurants, delivering pizzas, doing that kind of thing. I go in the Navy right out of high school and I do retail in the Navy. So we were in charge of the the stores and the vending machines and the barber shops and the laundry on the ship because the ship is a little city at sea, right? So you have, you have all those things, uh, little convenience stores and stuff like that on the ship. So we were in charge of all that. So I learned retail and I got some business and accounting training through the military. Uh, then when I got out, um, I, you know, the only thing I'd done to that point was restaurants. So I started working in restaurants and, um, one of the guys that I was working for was doing addition uh, on his restaurant. Uh, so he hired me to come in or the contractor that was doing addition on the restaurant I was working in hired me to come clean up after him. So I did, and I'm a hard worker. So he took a liking to me and I started following him around, learning from him as his helper. And, and then how started- old were you then? Uh, that was after the military. So, you know, early twenties, you know, I guess 18 to 22. So probably 22, okay. you know, 23 at that time. And, uh, uh, well, no, actually this was before I went to the Navy when I was working for this guy. So I was like 17, yeah, 16, 17. And then I, when I got out of the Navy, I was working with another guy out in California, um, when I got out there. So we were doing industrial construction there. So the restaurant guy, yeah, I was 17 when I did that. Uh, then I go in the Navy, I can get out and I'm working for this other guy that's doing industrial stuff out in California. We'd go into warehouses and build offices and um, put up storage racking systems like you see at Costco or Price Club or Sam's Club. 
uh, we put those big racks in and cages and build offices inside of warehouses. So I'm doing that and um, learning that business. And I always had a second job. So, you know, I'm making 10 bucks an hour right back then. So that's not enough. So I always had a second job at night, bartending, waiting tables, cooking, whatever to make money. Uh, so now I'm in my 20s. I'm 22, 23. And, um, you know, I'm working bartending at night. I'm doing construction during the day, building like metal buildings. I'm on a crew making 10 bucks an hour, walking 30 feet in the air on steel I-beams and, um, you know, trying to take some college classes for engineering on the side when I can. I'm married, you know, 23 years old and uh, getting ready to start a family. And uh, so I did that for a few years and I always did like kind of side jobs as well. On the weekends, I'd go out and build a fence for somebody or build a deck. So I'd learn it watching this old house and I'd buy books at Home Depot or HQ it was back then, uh, Home Quarters Warehouse. And I'd get the how-to books and I'd go out and build somebody a deck or a fence. So I'm, you know, handy and go with my hands. So I'm doing all these things, learning, right? And, um, and then I got a job managing restaurants in 1995. Um, yeah, it was 1995. I'm working in some restaurants and I'm probably 25 at this time. I've got two kids and uh, I get a job at Lone Star Steakhouses. I don't know if you had them or remember them. And uh, I get into the management program and they start, you know, training me and teaching me. And I learned really good business basics from them. I learned management. I learned leadership, delegation, you know, all of that through the military, but even more so here where we really drilled it down and had a system. And then I learned all about the numbers. I mean, we broke everything down. So, I mean, we had labor matrices, how many hours a week you could schedule. Um, you know, we had budgets, you know, for your food cost, how much, you know, food, how many pounds of chicken you can use, how many pounds of steak you can use. I mean, just all these little things with inventory and the numbers, which, you know, the business is about the numbers. So we drilled everything down, working it backwards, just like a multifamily apartment complex. You have income, you have all your expenses, restaurants, the same thing. Uh, and it's all your controllables, right? So I learned how to really drill down onto the operational costs of a business and then I learned how to manage people, lead people, how to delegate, motivate, inspire results out of people. So that's kind of how that evolved. So I'm 25 at the time. I do that for a couple of years and I get tired of the corporate thing. I always wanted my own business and I'm a surfer, lifelong surfer. So I've lived on the ocean my whole life. We've got two kids at this point. I'm 26, 27. This is 1997. Um, so I'm 52 now. So whatever that math is in 1997, we decide we're going to move to the Outer Banks or I decide I'm going to quit my job, move to the Outer Banks of North Carolina, where I always wanted to live being from Virginia beach, the best surf on the East coast. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of sharks and, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you see them, but they didn't mess with you. They only eat the tourists down there. <laughs> yeah. So if you're local, you're fine. So, uh, but we'd see them, you know, everyone. So I just, you know, tiger sharks, they usually mess with you. Sand, sand sharks. But there's been a few last couple of years. You know, I know you guys attacks. had you guys had a good run. Uh, it's it's yeah. up there as far as shark attacks go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The last few years have been crazy. I don't know what's going on. But anyways, <laughs> um, so I moved there in 1997, and I guess I'm 26, 27 at the time. And I moved there. I wanted to open a restaurant, um, and I worked in the restaurant industry the first year. Didn't like it. Took that fall and winter off because you know it's a seasonal thing, and decided you know um, I wanted to get some stuff done at my house. I was calling some contractors, and nobody would call me back, right? And uh, I was like, man, this is nuts. So I'm talking to my neighbors, and my neighbors like, yeah, it's so busy. Everybody's so busy, you can't even get anybody to return a phone call. If you want like a deck built or addition put on your house or anything like that, like I was trying to do. Um, so I said, you know what? I'm I'm good at this stuff. I'm going to start a business. So I went and you know started started my company. I got a name, filed it. This courthouse had no clue how to, you know, really run my own business. I'd had a couple little side businesses before, but nothing ever at the level that this thing became. So I went out, you know, started the company. It was just me, my truck and tools. My first job was 500 bucks, built a little deck for a restaurant, started doing whatever I could do myself. Then I hired another guy in the field to help me. First year we did 250,000, you know, then the next year we did 750. Next year we did a million two, then two and a half and seven. Next thing you know, we're doing $30 million. And I'm one of the largest builders down there, but, um, you know, at that point, so in the restaurant industry, man, I was working seven days a week, 12, 14, sometimes 16 hours a day, opening restaurants, you know, doing a lot. So it, it was a lot of hard work, you know, and it was like late nights doing inventory, you know, writing schedules. Literally, we didn't really have computers. They had to sit down with a piece of paper and schedule 40 employees, you know, and uh, I mean, you talk about hard, you know, so-and-so can't work this day and so-and-so can't work that day. You're trying to work this. So you really learn how to how to multitask and how to do a lot of things, but it's a lot of work. I get to the Outer Banks and, you know, things change a little bit down there because it's more Monday through Friday kind of stuff. 
I'm working for myself. So I'm, you know, I'm a do whatever it takes kind of guy. So if I'm, you know, need to be working until eight, nine o'clock at night to finish a job instead of coming back the next day so I can start another one, you know, that's what I'll do. But I was taking my weekends off and I was coaching my kids, you know, in the sports they played. So I was there. I was around. I'm not a workaholic, but I will do whatever it takes to get something going, get it up and running. And then once it settles in, then, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'll take plenty of time. So when my company was at its peak and we were doing the most business we'd done, I had a team, I had 20 employees. Um, you know, that's when I had the most flexibility, the most time on my hands. And I was doing what I really loved to do, which was finding deals and opportunities and do other things, leveraging the talents and abilities of others. So, um, you know, that's, that's what I'm really good at is finding people that are experts at what they do, bringing them in to fill in all of my weaknesses, do the things I don't know how to do. And then coach them to success. You know, so we were building million million dollar beach houses. I went from handyman building little decks and fences and replacing windows to doing big remodels to building small spec houses to building giant multi million dollar luxury oceanfront homes. I've never built a house in my life before I built my first houses there. So what I did was I went to my neck, my biggest competitor, the guys that have been there forever, building 50, 60 of these things a year, and I hired their top people to come work for me and help me build this company. And then I let them do it. So that was what was exciting. You know, I found these guys that were doing what I wanted to do, that were where I wanted to be, but didn't want their own business. They wanted to help somebody else do it. And then I brought them in and turned them loose like it was their business within my envelope. And then we just blew the thing up. So that's, uh, you know, that's how it happened. That's awesome. Can you, I mean, that's a ton to unpack and thank you for going into that in so much detail because I think it's very interesting. I think what will be you know interesting for me selfishly and i think us selfishly as well is because we're still on the smaller side from an employee basis and company size and it's interesting to hear how you know you bring people in and empower them and educate them to come into your process and build it what do you, what are some things that you can share that other people can take on because i'm sure there's plenty of people like us um to help with that process and things that you learned of you know, whether, you know, not necessarily this is real estate focused, but most people listening are going to be real estate focused. But, you know, how do you, what's some of the things you learned to help with that process? You know, the biggest thing is you want to fill your weaknesses, right? Or if there's something you want to do. So, so you guys, you know, if you really want to grow and scale and do the big deals and build this huge portfolio, you want to find people that they've done that. They've already done it. They've been there. They know how to do it. And you want to hire out your weaknesses. So whatever you're not good at and whatever you don't like doing, Fill those gaps in with your team. But the biggest thing is you got to develop yourselves as leaders, right? So your job as leaders is to inspire results out of your team, right? So you got to find the right people. You got to put them in the right position and you got to let them do their job. And what happens with a lot of people, especially younger people, is the ego. I'm the boss. I can do whatever I want. I can say whatever I want. You can't be that way, right? You have to be consistent so that everybody knows exactly what to expect every day. I'm going to turn a light on here. Um, you got to be, there we go. You got to be consistent. So uh, everybody knows, you know, uh, what to expect from you every day. So that, so that, you know, how some people are moody, you don't know how they're going to be. You don't want people walking on eggshells. You want them to feel like they belong. Um, You got to be able to create a vision that everybody can buy into and be able to articulate that vision. It needs to be very clearly articulated. So, you know, you've got your mission statement and, you know, all that kind of stuff, but the vision for the company as a whole. So if you see yourselves in a 10,000 square foot office building and you've got an executive desk and your big chair, and you've got a staff of 20 people, you've got a CFO, you've got your analyst, you've got your acquisition team, you've got your property management, asset management team. You need to have that on your you know, vision board and visualize that, and convey that vision to your staff. This is where we're going to be, $1 billion assets under management. These types of properties this is what our office looks like. This is where we're located. And then convey that vision and get everybody excited about it, but then let them do it. So when you find great people that, you know, if you've got Tom Brady, you don't put him at wide receiver. And then, you know, you put Tom Brady at quarterback and you let him throw the ball. Yeah. So, you know, that's what you do is you find those aces, you put them in the right spot, the right place, and you coach them to success and you let them do their job. You let them make mistakes and you got to be consistent. You got to support and encourage and inspire um, those team members. But the biggest thing you got to do is make sure that you understand what you want, where you're going, lay out that clear direction and no uncertain terms, exactly what's expected of everybody and when every single position. Give them the systems, the training, documented processes so they know what they're supposed to be doing and they know where they're headed. And then you got to measure that performance. And here's the key. 
You're measuring the performance. You're measuring the behavior, not the individual, and holding that accountable to the goal. So, you know, if I ask you to do something, you know, and you mess up, it's it's first thing I got to do is look at myself. Why did I not get the result I was looking for? Why are we not getting the outcome? So as the leader, did I give you everything you needed? Tools, training systems, and support to be successful. But more important, did I give you clear direction, exactly what I expected and when? I need you to look at 100 deals this week and find one good one. You know, find me one good deal. I need you to look at 100, but I only want you looking at $20 million assets, 100 to 200 units in Detroit. You know, that's it. Find 100 deals and, you know, in that parameter, so that's very clear direction, exactly what I expect from them and when. So then I measure that performance. And if they didn't do it, well, why not? You either have a can't do or a won't do. So if they can't do it, why can't they? You know, did we give them what they need? Uh, and if you have all of that in place and you've given them everything you need and they still can't do it, then you got the wrong person in the wrong role. That's just where that's at, right? So it's not personal, nothing to get upset about. You just shift them, find somebody else who can do it or, you know, make sure you're hiring the right person for the right role to begin with. Um, a won't do, you just get rid of them and you get rid of them quick. So you want to ascertain who's going to be a right fit for the team as soon as possible. And if they are great, if they're not, then you got to get rid of them and move on because there's going to be some people you just, you just don't want to work with. The other thing that, that's really critical is understanding other people first before, you know, understanding yourself. So you know how to relate to them, you know how to communicate with them and the disc profiling is huge. So everybody on your team, you should do disc profiling. You can do it for free online, learn all the different DISC personalities because it teaches you how to interact with each other and how to approach each other because we all need to be approached differently and approach is 100% of the game. How I approach you with a task or with a uh, request is going to be huge in determining how and if you will give me the outcome I'm looking for. So in a short nutshell, that's basically leadership management, delegation, motivation. You got to develop yourself first and foremost as a great leader. You got to find great people. You got to put them in the right position and you got to let them do their job. And they got to know exactly what's expected and when. Then you got to measure that on a regular basis and hold it accountable to the goals. It's fantastic. That, um, yeah, that, that's it in a nutshell. And, and you said so many things uh, that resonated well because I like to think like to think I'm good at that, but <laughs> Chris may differ, but, <laughs> but uh, no, I think that what you broke down is just super important. Cause it's not, it, it, you know, what I've always done really well in any job that I've had. And even when I was, you know, I had people working for me was putting people in positions to make them successful as opposed to just, you know, this is what I need. You have to do it. You can't do it. Next person, that person may be really good at something. You got to figure it out and put them in that role. And I think that that's such, it'll make life so much easier when you realize the right person's in the right role. You might have the right person in the wrong role. And if you could figure that out, it helps. And I think that's super important. Obviously, you know, Greg's done it, you know, numerous times. And what he said is important is, is to a T. So anyone listening, you know, and it doesn't matter what business you're in, you know, maybe there's more real estate people listening to this than anything else. But if you want a real estate company, you know, if you want to, you know, you want to fix and flip 10 houses a year, that's different than I want to have $2 billion under management and knowing what it takes to work backwards. I say it all the time, you know, you take that and you integrate that and you're going to have a lot more success than, you know, picking up the pieces as you go. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in a lot of businesses, you want to hire attitude, right? So you can train skills, but you can't train attitude. Somebody's either got a great attitude or they don't. You, you know what I mean? And the la- and culture of a company is important. That's the first and foremost. So the culture of the company is set by the leader. Everybody's got to buy into that and be held accountable to the culture. So some people just aren't going to be a good fit. So you got to discern that if you can in the interview process. And if you can't, then you got to get rid of them quickly if you find somebody is going to be a problem. The biggest, you know, and the other thing is, like I said, right, right people, right role. The biggest mistake I've made in business early on, I like to help people, you know, and I want people to, to have a better life. It's just how I'm wired. And, you know, through coaching, mentoring, just the way I'm wired. So I would have a tendency when I was younger to want to take somebody and promote them and put them in a position that they either didn't really want or weren't ready for. So a lot of people say, oh, yeah, man, I want to be an entrepreneur or you know, I want my own business or I want to make a bunch of money or I want to be CEO, right? A lot of people say they want that, but do you really, you know, are you really willing to do whatever it takes morally, legally, and ethically to get there and to not only get there, but stay there, which means whatever it takes, you know? So like, um, you know, you said you were good, at, you know, generally at um, understanding what role people need to be in. But if I asked you guys, are you good leaders? Are you good at what you do? How would you answer that? I don't know. I, 
I would say yes. Well, I'm, I'm not leading anybody, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, and the only reason why I would, you know, maybe it's maybe it's patting myself on the back, but but I, my I know my biggest weakness is is you know my, that my wife says I, it's a charity case. Like you 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 want I'm not unsimilar. I'm only 32, but yeah. I, I really do like. I want to change people's lives if I can, if I can help them. But my wife and I think even Chris, you know, there are times when he's like, just call it quits, bro. Like it's, it's, yeah. that's not going to work. And I'm like, but I, we're almost there. And that's my biggest meeting I know that for sure. Cause I try and I think I can make anybody work. It's a problem. But well, at the same time, I know that, you know, you, I've always, even, even from when, you know, when I was younger playing baseball and being a captain, like I've always had that role. So I like to think I am, I, you know, maybe Chris would say something different. He could speak to it. Cause you know, we lead, I lead you a little bit, mm-hmm. but, um, I, I, I think I am. Yeah. yeah. I think just maybe Greg, you don't understand the dynamic. John and Don are the two partners. I'm the asset manager underneath them. So, okay. Just so that's where I said I don't need anybody. <laughs> I, it's you know we don't have twenty people yet, so um, we're we're working towards there. Um, no, I think to be critical, right? Because I think you guys I, do do a lot of things. I do think the one thing you and Don can do better, and you both know this is setting a clearer picture. So, and that's something we've worked 100%. on a lot in the last twenty four months, yep. eighteen months, and it's night and day from where it was. And we've spoken about it, so that's why I know I can bring it up. That is, for me, the number one thing that it's like, okay, if we had a significantly tighter criteria, five-year goal, one-quarter goal, we'd be able to do much more. And I think that's been apparent in the last six months no as doubt. we've started integrating a lot of that stuff. The amount of stuff we've been able to get done and stay on top of, I think, has changed everything we've been doing for the last six to 12 months. Yep. So I think that's the number one thing that – you know, you two and us as a, you know, general group have to continue to do better on because it's shown proof of concept over the last six months, as well as heard it from other people, you know, not just, you know, you've been saying the same thing we've heard from other people. So, and that's one thing, you know, to touch on that. And, and I, that's where sometimes Don and myself at the top, you know, that picture is not clear sometimes. And I, I, I say it all the time. I said, you know, we got to be more specific. This is what we have to do. And that, that's why it trickles down. And that criticism is a hundred percent warranted because at the top, sometimes I think our visions go a little sideways and that's not good. No. So that's cool right there. So I'll get back to this in a second. So we'll turn this into a coaching session. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So I asked you if you were good at what you do, and you're like, yeah, yeah, I think so. What if I asked you if you were great? Are no. you great at what you do? Are I, you the best you at what you do? And if not, why? So I know my answer is no, and the and the 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 reason it. I what do I say all the time? I say we don't have. W- we don't have something that we do better than everybody else. We might do it better than everybody else, but we don't do it the best. We don't have a competitive advantage. And Chris will say, yes, we do. You know, you're offering things that other people aren't, so on and so forth. But that's where I know I'm not great yet at because we don't do anything. You know, what we do, multifamily syndication, there's a million people that do it. All right. So let's hold that. So I didn't ask you about your company. I asked you individually, Chris, are you the best you can be at what you do? Yeah. Not are you the best syndicator in the business? Yeah. No, no. Yeah. I would say in, in even the answer is no. I know I can do better at my physical, what I'm doing. I definitely could do it better. Yeah. Right. I, I think, think, you know, me personally, John, the same thing would be for you. If you're an analyst, you know. Yeah. I think I'm great at a lot of things and I think I'm working on several different things and getting better at. Um, okay. So, you know. I know I'm nowhere near where I can be, but I also know I'm very early in the process as well. And I'm continually picking things up. Right. So then the next question is, what are you guys individually doing individually, forget the company, to be the best you can be at what you're doing and growing? Because as leaders and, you know, Chris, you're the leader of the organization. John, you know, you're a leader in your department. You're leading yourself. You're leading whoever it is you're dealing with when you're analyzing assets, the brokers, you know, the people out in the field, you are leading them. So as a leader, both of you in your areas, you got to be developing yourselves. That is your fiduciary responsibility to everybody in your life. So you're either leading your friends, you're leading your family, you're leading your business, you're leading your subcontractors, suppliers, vendors, no matter what position you have, you are a leader, right? 
So what you want to be doing is developing yourself every single day. So to be great and to be the best, you've got to take the reps. You got to put the time in, you got to put the reps in. So you want to make sure that you're pouring into yourself every single day. I've never had one song on my iPhone and my iTunes back in the day. So we'll go way back. Okay. I've, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars developing myself, books, tapes, courses, seminars, um, everything that I've ever had. <clears throat> it was back in, you know, books on tape, you know, cassette tapes that had the little walk man. <laughs> then it was the CD player, right? And then it was the iPod. You know, I, ha- I still have it somewhere, 80 gig iPod, never any music. It was always books, professional development, personal development, you know, on the business specifically on mindset, you know, Tony Robbins, Zig Ziglar, Jim Rohn, uh, Norman Vincent Peale, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki. I mean, everything I could find that was business related. My management philosophy and systems come from Ken Blanchard, the one minute manager. Um, so constantly, constantly, constantly pouring into yourself. That's how you develop yourself as a great leader, a better leader is to continually develop your skill set. Leadership is a skill set just like anything else. So in order to become the best at what you do, you know, in order to create the vision of the company, you got to be putting those reps in every single day. If you want to hit 300, man, you got to take 100 swings a day or whatever it is and get in that batting cage and put the, put the reps in. So same thing from a leadership standpoint. And, you know, try to create the best company you can create that, you know, like uh, to John's point, the vision. So it sounds like, you know, there's got to be a very clearly defined, articulated vision for the company of where you see that. If it's 20 employees, a billion dollars assets under management, man, put it down, get it in writing, hold a company meeting and say, this is where we're going and this is how we're going to get there. So that big vision then becomes a yearly goal. In order to get there, we got to look at so many deals because we know we got to look at so many deals to get uh, you know, so many LOIs out. After so many LOIs, we're going to actually close so many deals. Mm-hmm. So then that works so that everybody in the organization knows what they need to be doing every single day. And not only that, throughout the day in order to hit that goal. And then everybody has that vision in front of them constantly in terms of what that company looks, you know, is going to look like, needs to look like. You can even make a video. It can be written. It can be on a board. It can be on a wall. It can be in a video. Whatever resonates with you guys, that vision needs to be detailed, clearly articulated. <clears throat> and I wouldn't go too far. You know, I'd go out reasonable year, two, three years, something like that, where you see the organization, your company and the roles in there. That way, everybody knows. They know where they're going. Leadership between you and Don, you guys have got to be consistent. You've got to be on the same page at all times. And if there's ever any disconnect, it can never be in front of the employees or the staff. So if you guys ever have something you don't agree on, you got to go off campus and figure that out because you've got to be unified just like parents in front of kids. You know, not that staff is kids, but, you know, just that leadership <laughs> message needs to be consistent, right? The CEO and the XO in the military, you know, the commanding officer and the executive officer who's his second in command, and they got to be on board at all times and they got to be in sync. And if there's a disagreement, they go, you know, privately and they talk about it. Um, the other thing is open door. So the other big thing that I had was um, this is a, a, a full disclosure, non recourse organization. Okay. So in meetings, just like you guys just did, I would, with my employees, it was always full disclosure, non-recourse. Tell me what you think and what we need to do. And there will be no recourse. Get it off your chest. So you want bad news first, full disclosure, you know, non-recourse. So if something's going wrong, your people need to know that they can come to you and Don at any time and say, man, I just blew this. I screwed this up so that you can fix it quickly, put a system in place so it doesn't happen again. And it, that, that mess up may be, you know, whatever it is, they need to feel like they can come to you with anything and everything, including a leadership issue with you so that it can be fixed. A system can be put in place and it doesn't fester and become a big problem. I, I, agree. <coughs> I, I say it all the time. I'm, I, I'm, I'm that second part about the open door. I tell people I want to hear the worst of the worst when I don't want it to build up inside. Cause then it snowballs out of control. When you have a problem, mm-hmm. if you have a problem, let's talk about it. Let's, wh- what can we do to, to fix that issue? And I, I, I could not, you know, I, I think I was, you know, you said it better than I did, but mm-hmm. I, I agree with that. Uh, I agree with everything obviously, but, um, yeah. And the, the biggest the, thing to do is make sure that you take notes when, when your employees are talking to you. And they either one of you, whatever, you know, write it down and repeat it back to them. So, John, what I heard you say is as an organization, Don and I aren't necessarily on the same page. Our vision and and where we're going isn't clearly defined and articulated. We need a more detailed systemic plan for where this company is going in order for you to be the best you can be and thrive in this organization. Yeah. And then you just wait and hear what he says. Yeah. No, 100%. I'm curious, too, because I've... 
always struggled to be like big into the personal development stuff Mm -hmm. like reading reading business books i've never been able to do i've been forcing myself to do it i just i like some of them and i really don't like a lot of them were you big into it early on or was it something that became more attractive over time yeah so it was at a point in my life when i was open to it right so i was young cocky thought i could do anything when i you know and then then there came a point and i think the first one of the first books i read was rich dad poor dad and i didn't get real estate out of that book what i got was um build businesses that generate cash flow to invest in other assets so that's what i got out of that book and then i read uh think and grow rich by napoleon hill and i read um uh, power of positive thinking, Norman Vincent Peale. And then I read some management books at our company. We had to read management books, the one minute manager series, managing by Harold Janine, high output management by Andrew Grove, who is the C- CEO of ITT. So I was reading leadership and management books and I was really getting into it because I could see how it was affecting me and the organization I was in. So I saw the results of practicing what it was. The one minute manager system is all about providing clear direction, knowing certain terms exactly what's expected and when, measuring performance, showing what good performance looks like, rewarding good performance <clears throat> in public, and redirecting bad performance in private and resetting the goal. So that's what that system is all about, helping people feel good about themselves, good about the organization, so they'll produce better results in a sincere way, not a manipulative way. So, um, I, you know, and I'm a, I'm a seeker of wisdom. I'm a lifelong learner, right? So even though I didn't go to college, I'm very self-educated. And even to this day, you know, I have a hard time reading some things, but some things resonate with me. So I devour them. Books on tape were easier. Now the mindset stuff, I don't mean positive thinking. If I think I can fly, I can fly. And manifestation <laughs> and stuff like that. You know, what I do believe in is visualizing. I've seen everywhere I've been before I've gotten there in my mind. I've seen every project, you know, come out of the ground before I built it. I can see it there, like your company. I can see your company when I just described it to you right now. I can see your office and I can see you guys thriving and your 20 employees running around and doing deal. I mean, I can see that. So that's the vision you have to develop, you know, just like Disney did when he walked around that land in Orlando and saw his park coming out of the ground, right? He couldn't see everything it is now, but he could see that. So Developing positive mindset is a can-do attitude and the for, you know the fortitude and the stick to of different things. So you got to find what resonates with you. Some things resonate with some people better than others, but I'm not talking about you know all of that self-help you know flavor of the day stuff. I'm talking about real hard-hitting stuff where you understand how your mind works and that you know the doubts are going to be in there and that you're going to have limiting beliefs. A lot of people hear limiting beliefs and they think you know, self-help guru stuff, what limiting a belief is, I mean, we can't buy a $50 million building. Why should we try that? There's 10 other people bidding on it. We'll never get it. So I'm not even going to try. That's a limiting belief, you know, or, you know, we can't have a billion dollar billion assets under management. We can only raise, you know, a hundred million. We need to raise 400 million to get there. And it just, you know, so we're not, even, you know, that's a limiting belief. Whereas you want to develop a mindset of how can I make this happen? Not, I can't. That was a big thing that I learned early on was how can I do this? How can I afford this? How can I build this? How can I get where I want to be? Not I can't. And then that puts, you know, action, action steps behind the word. So you, you think it, you speak it, you do it. So uh, that's positive mental attitude. That's positive mindset of, you know, I can do anything that's reasonable as long as I put my mind to it, educate myself, see it first, believe I can get there and then go get it. And then when those doubts creep in, you just keep going. You just don't even listen. You just push right through it. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's something that I've, I've some to a certain degree personally seen that we've been <coughs> creating, you know, as I said, you know, we've been creating more of that vision and goal setting and creating tasks and steps to get there. And I think that's something that I've seen over the last six months really change how I and we have been able to do things. And I think you know, for me, that proof of concept has started opening doors where now I've started looking at more books and more audio books. And I'm, I, I'm much bigger into podcasts because I like the conversation aspect of it. Podcasts are great. More so than like the reading of audio books and actually reading a book. So I've been open, you know, listening to more educational and thought leadership podcasts instead of like 
instead of listening to the Joe Rogan experience, it's you know, the, yeah. the, what is it? The hundred dollar MBA and uh, Harvard business review and things like that. Yeah. It's still like Joe Rogan from time to time, but you know, trying to change it up. Um, you know, that proof of concept over the last six months has really opened my eyes to how things are possible and how the small steps can lead to significantly larger goals than you thought you would have been able to do. And it's kind of shifted my mindset of like, okay, what is actually possible over five years? And that's why too, I think, you know, when you started talking, I immediately defaulted to, hey, take me back to that beginning because very, very selfishly, and I'm going to fully admit this. I I don't know if, if nobody else gets any value out of this, I, I don't give a shit because I'm getting a ton of stuff out of it. So if everybody wants to chalk this one up as a loss, that's fine yeah, by and- me. Um, I don't think that'll be the case by any means, but that be that as it may, because, you know, it's been four years now since I really entered the, you know, adult business world before that it was still very much a kid at the time. Um, even, you know, a couple of years out of school and the last four years has been very eye opening that shift and change. So I was very curious to hear from, from I'll take credit from, for that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I, think, awesome. I think I would have done it sooner if it wasn't for you. So, yeah. um, but be that as it may, it's very interesting to hear a lot of the things that you've said, I've started to experience and realize over the last couple of years. And that's why I really wanted to go down that route where this has been almost 0% real estate focused. But I think a lot of what you've spoken about has been directly applicable to whether it's personal real estate investing, owning real estate, being in and around the real estate investing world, or growing, like you said, a you know a billion dollar asset or multi billion dollar asset company. I was gonna say, even you know, I think you know, and whether it's selfish or not, you know, I would say out of all the podcasts we've done, this one's got a highly rank. And if someone doesn't listen to every minute of this, this is just look in the mirror and just you know, even if you want to be a better husband, a better father, a better a better friend. You could take the principles and it doesn't have to be scaling a company. It's it's it goes it goes deeper than that. And this, you know, this is more important than, you know, bullshitting with Chris Jackson about real <laughs> estate. Cause yeah. that's fun and everyone likes that. But at the same time, you know, I'm on the other side and I I've recommended a ton of books mm-hmm. because I think that you know, that self, you know, what, you know, whatever that stuff is, the mindset, all those things, you know, half the things you've mentioned I've read or I'm, I'm not read, I'll listen to the audiobook, And that's, you know, I come in every day and I'm like, how can we implement this to make us better? And I, I truly try to, um, and I know we can do better and we've done a really good job over the last six months. Cause I, you know, we made a conscious effort to, but, uh, you know, just, just, you know, people should just not do anything, listen to this. And then, you know, if you really want to make something of something, you know, this is a great starting point in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. The other thing I would say too, so that's where it all started was just pouring into myself first and switching my mindset of, you know, what is possible and just, man, I just, you know, I just have a voracious appetite for consuming stuff. And like I said, it was Tony Robbins, it was all kinds of different things. But the other thing too, is you, you grew up in a very different time than I did. You know, you've got a lot of you know, things, you know, you grew up with social media and all that. I, I didn't, you know, um, so, it, you know, it's a little bit different, but find people that you admire and start reading their stuff and their story. Sometimes that's easier. Uh, and then you can get into inside of their minds and how it works. And, you know, literally, I believe, I know I can do anything that I want to do within reason. I'm not going to go throw touchdowns for, you know, the New England Patriots, but, you know, <laughs> Other than that, if I apply myself, if I educate myself, if I put the time in and put the reps in, there, there's nothing I can't do if I want to do it. Yep. You know, it's desire. So that's the, that's the other thing where, where I said, you know, a lot of people say, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to, I want to be a syndicator or I want to be a millionaire. Do you really? I mean, do you really? Because what it takes is, is what I just said. You got to pour into yourself first. You got to educate yourself. You got to become an S- expert. You got to become the best you, you can be at what you're doing before any of that's going to happen. And you got you just got to put the time in. So, you know, that, that's really, that's really what it takes. And from a company standpoint, you can have a regular, um, whatever time of day works good for you. First thing in the morning, have a, you know, motivational minute where you come in and you work on mindset, you work on positive, you know, uh, business principles, you know, every day, and then just do those exercises. So that was how we learned in the restaurants. We had regular management meetings and we literally had our management books that we would read and we would discuss the philosophies of management, how it was working. And we apply the techniques in the business, you know, of the, like the one minute manager system, you know, which is praising good performance, you know, Hey John, man, you did an awesome job on that, that underwriting on that, 
on that deal. Specifically, when you broke down the operating costs, you know, a lot of people are missing insurance these days. It's three fifty a unit, not two fifty or or two hundred. You know, taxes are going to readjust. You caught that. That's going to save the company tons of money. That's what's going to keep us moving forward. If I praise you like that in front of people, how many other people do you think are going to be trying to do something? You know, and that's not manipulative. It's sincere, you know, and if something doesn't work, it's understanding where it comes from. If you've gone through divorce or whatever happens and you've got people in your business world or family or whatever, you seek first to understand if you're not getting the result, what's going on? Maybe they're dealing with something in their life and they just need to, you just, they just need somebody to understand what they're going through, you know, and you identify with them by letting them know, like I said, you know, what I heard you say was we're not cohesive at the top. We don't have a strategic plan. You don't know every single day what you're supposed to do, and where we're supposed to go. And then what do you say when I say that to you? John? Yeah, that that's a hundred percent true. It's like that has to change tomorrow. That, right. When so I hear then, that, I hear that. I feel like that's one of the major problems. Like I'm sitting here right now, you know, when this is over, I'm grabbing Don. I'm saying, you know, you know, sit down. We have to talk because that's you break it down into the that's the un you know that's the truth that nobody wants to hear. But that yeah. is the truth. It's just that you know there it comes in. It's you know what are we doing today? And you know even with, you know we have to define this. I say it. I say it every Monday morning at our meeting. And mm-hmm. and uh, my mind's racing because you you just hit the nail on the head. And it's just yes, yeah, that all has to be clear. So everyone's you know working towards the same goal as opposed to well I'm going to do this and then that and then and next thing you know nothing gets done that's yeah. that's how yeah. I look at and it. I think and keep I, it up on the board yeah and I think to, I think to be clear because I don't want it to be like oh these guys have no idea where the fuck they're going <laughs> it's no not no a, it's, it's the entrepreneurial a, it's a, curse right yeah right I just you know anybody that's like oh shit like, I'm I gave the, I gave these guys. idiots money <laughs> <laughs> it's f- from I it's it's a very rough outline that gets wider as time goes on. So it's like, I know for the next week, like, here's what we have to do. I know over the next quarter, pretty damn very close. Here's what we have to do. But a year, two year, five years out, it starts from like, if you're not watching, it's tough to see what I'm doing. But hands start close. And as I go forward and forward, it starts getting wider and wider. And I think that's where we've really struggled over the last 12 months. It's like, okay, I know what I'm supposed to be doing pretty much day in, day out, week in, week out even over the next 90, 120 days, whatever it is. But as we start getting farther along, it's okay. What am I, what do I ask you? Like, are we really doing what I need to do today to hit those targets out? Because it's not a bullseye. It's an outer ring on that target. So John, what I'm hearing you say is from a company standpoint, you feel like you could be way more effective and do a much better job and be a much bigger contribution to this company if I had a clearly articulated plan of exactly what you should be doing every single day that ends up in a weekly, monthly, yearly outcome that can be measured. Yeah. Oh, uh, you said John. You meant me though, right? Chris. Yes, John. Chris, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I got you guys backwards. <laughs> I was like, thinking you were Chris like, the whole time. And you're I just wanted to make sure because I was like, I'm pretty that's sure. That's why you guys are looking at me funny. Yeah. But, uh, I've been Chris no, and John yeah, and no, backwards the whole time. No, it's 100. percent It's you know, if you know exactly what you have to do, it's you don't have to worry about if you're making a misstep or not. It's yeah. You know, here's what expected. I'm either gonna put up or shut up, and you know, that's the name of the game. So here's the key. So that little conversation, that little lesson, you just came into, you know. Um, John's office. <laughs> yeah. And Chris came into John's office and you said, man, I got, and I'm just frustrated. And John repeated that back to you. You're going to walk out of the office charged up, ready to go. And you're going to feel like, man, I've been heard and I know where this thing's going. Sure. You see what I'm saying? So as entrepreneurs, we're so wrapped up in the big picture. We just kind of expect everybody to do whatever. Yeah. Hey, take care of that. And we're just, we're thinking our job is to go out there and focus on the big picture. We forget what you need and what the what the team needs in order to keep them going. So that's the little things that make yeah. the biggest difference. And then, you know, um, John, to your point, that goes everywhere. That's at work. That's at home. It's your, it's your relationships. It's your volunteer activities, your church, whatever it is, you know, your softball team, bowling, whatever. That stuff transcends everywhere. 100%. Um, I think that's an unbelievable yeah. place to wrap, but I think we got a yeah. ton awesome. out of it. I think we'll just like we ended Chris Jackson's. I think it would be awesome if we did a part two because I think left a lot of stuff out. I think we can tailor a lot of stuff into you know the real estate success. So kind of take a different angle at it. Yeah. So you know, hopefully, you know, in a couple months we can revisit and do this again because I think there's a lot more we can tie into it. Um, but thank you so much for coming on. I know I personally got a ton out of it. I think John did as well. I think 
if not everybody, I think a ton of people listening are going to as well. Um, if people want to learn more about you, figure out who you are, get in touch with you, any of that stuff, where can they do that? Where should they go to? Yeah, the website. So everything's on my website. I've got YouTube channel, podcast, all that, where, you know, if you want some short, serious, you know, no pitching, no, no, it's just straight up what we just did, broken down into simple bite-sized pieces on all kinds of stuff. So gregdickerson.com is my website. And uh, that's where, you know, everything is. People can find me, connect with me everywhere. And um, like I said, I do videos every day. They're just short to the point. And it's all across all kinds of different things, leadership, motivation, commercial real estate, residential, just really cool stuff. Awesome. Thanks again so much. This was perfect. Yeah, it was good to see you guys. Thanks for having me. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.